Hey folks, how's it going? This is Jason, host of Fighting Words Financial. Let me know if you can hear me out there. I uh, don't have one of my screens up, so I don't even know if anyone is watching at this point. But let me know as soon as you can if you guys can hear my sound, because I did have a little bit of a problem uh, the last time I got on. So uh, yeah, let's talk about that market today. Uh, so Look, in, inflation fears and recession fears are starting to rise a little bit, um, and, I, and I know that after last week's sort of uh, mini rally on Friday, I mean, Nasdaq was up something like 400 points, so that was amazing. Uh, Shula's Joe says, hey, Jason, can hear loud and clear. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Patrick Mulligan and Shula's Joe. Uh, Patrick Mulligan, not sure where you're tuning in from, but you're on my live streams all the time. Shula's Joe, I know you're somewhere in the U.K., uh, nice to hear from you guys today. So look, today the NASDAQ 100 was down 122 points or about 1%. The Dow Jones was basically flat. The S&P 500 was basically flat. And the Russell 2000 was down by about half a percent. So uh, so Patrick Mulligan uh, says he's from Ireland. Awesome. So uh, Ireland is one of the places that I haven't been to yet. Uh, one of these days I'm going to make it over there. And I promise you that as an American, I'm not going to go through the whole country telling everyone that I'm Irish too. Uh, so <laughs> I had an Irish roommate in college. He said that was one of the things that annoyed him the most. Uh, all right. So look, as you guys can tell from this chart over here that I'm sharing, um, well, you can't really tell because it's kind of small, but the only sector that is up for the entire year is energy. Everything else is down. And I kind of want to make that point right now to you guys. If your accounts are down, don't feel bad. Uh, unless you have a widely diversified account, you're not just down, you're down pretty big. Some of the most, everything from real estate to uh, technology, to communications, to the NASDAQ 100, uh, to uh, the S&P 500 down 15%, almost everything is down 15%. Unless you're overweighted in energy at this point, then you aren't up for the year, uh, year to date. That's just the way things are going. Um, so remember though, I, I've said this before, the stock market's a forward looking pricing mechanism and, uh, we're pricing where the economy, you know, wh where the market thinks the economy is going to be six to nine months from now. So a couple of things I wanted to address today. I, I do want to talk a little bit about this story that I saw on, um, on Barron's and it's come out a couple of times on, uh, I think on Yahoo finance. And it says, you know, many customers on crypto flat platforms could lose funds in a bankruptcy. So, uh, so I'm a little far removed from being like a new retail investor. So this is one of the things that I kind of thought that everyone knew. So in the financial world, if you're in banking, you have the FDIC, which protects you from, um, you know, in case the bank goes under, you know, it's not solvent. It protects you basically $250,000 per registration, meaning if you have an individual account, you have $250,000 under deposit that is protected by the FDIC. If you have a joint account, then it's, it's you, know, you basically have $250,000 for every uh, everyone on the account. Or if you have a trust account, it's the same way. For every beneficiary of that trust, you get $250,000 of protection. In the investment world, you have the SIPC, which is the Securities Investors Protection Corporation, which is a private insurance agency that ensures uh, folks who have brokerage accounts against liability when the brokerage company goes out of business. And that doesn't happen very often, but it does occasionally. Now, they're not insuring your investments. What they're insuring is the cash that you have on deposit uh, there. And then, oh, so we got someone from Belgium too. Uh, what part of Belgium? We're going to do the Liege. Uh, can you needle on uh, one of those? Are you uh, basically um, a French speaker or a, or a Dutch speaker? I don't remember French today for some reason, but anyway, um, back to the SIPC here. The SIPC protects you from your cash being seized in the event of a bankruptcy, it doesn't protect your investments, of course, if they go down. But uh, there is no such mechanism in place for uh, traders in uh, in cryptocurrencies, most crypto uh, cryptocurrency um investor or investors realize that if they hold their wallets offline, if they're really into crypto, they, they understand this. And uh, if you hold your wallets offline, you don't have to worry about this at all. But for folks, for, for folks who have, you know, like a Coinbase account or something like that, there is no protective mechanism like the SIPC or the FDIC to guarantee your funds in the event of, uh, you know, Coinbase going bankrupt. Now that is not to say that, uh, 
Uh, and, and more importantly, there's no guarantee that your assets and your account are actually protected from the creditors of Coinbase should they go under or any of these other, uh, um, you know, any of these other crypto trading houses. Now, this is going to be the case for quite some time. It's This is not something that's going to be solved this year or next year. I think it's going to take a few years for uh, this to shake out. So uh, Nikhil Diva says, uh, I'm from India. Good vibes. Jepson says he's from Antwerp in the Netherlands. Uh, Antwerp, got good memories from that city. Uh, two girls named Ina and Katz actually are very good memories from that city. Long time ago. <laughs> anyway, uh, that's, a, that's a whole different story. Uh, but so... What I'm saying is like these concerns arose after Coinbase uh, included in its 10Q, this risk disclosure that said that customers could be considered to have, uh, they could be considered unsecured creditors in a bankruptcy proceeding. That would be the case if the SIPC wasn't around and we didn't have regulations in place to protect uh, brokerage account holders. Uh, you know, And that would that also would be the case if the FDIC didn't uh, exist and we had, and we didn't have the legal separation that we have with some of the acts that were, I think, passed in the 1920s or 1930s. Uh, this could mean that if Coinbase went under, they might not get any of their funds back until the senior creditors are paid. And this says, you know, if at all, in most cases, that never happens, right? With When another company goes under. So the uh, insurance, the insurance industry as well, like, uh, you know, like, like property and casualty insurance, all of those folks have those protection mechanisms in place. Cryptocurrency simply isn't mature enough to do that yet. If you look at the ability to easily trade cryptocurrency, that has only arisen in the last four or five years. And uh, I don't know why this made the news. Like I said, I, I thought that most people who were invested in in cryptocurrency would probably realize this, but I guess I didn't realize until recently that one out of five Americans has actually owned or does own cryptocurrency right now. So it's far more widespread than I thought, but um, you know, human behavior looks fairly similar with every gold rush we've ever had. And I'm just using the word gold rush. I'm just to sort of set your mind about what I'm talking about here. Anytime we have the creation of a new asset class or the idea that wealth can be created uh, easily from something new that's happening, we have the same pattern of human behaviors behaviors that leaches in to what's going on. And uh, this is starting to happen with cryptocurrency as well. It's been happening for a while. There are about 17,000 cryptocurrencies out there. And these are just the ones that I kind of like counted uh, today, basically. There, there might even be more than that. So there's four or five of them that I consider... Um, cryptocurrency projects that are likely to succeed and stick around forever. And there's likely to be a few more than that. Um, but these are, there are four or five of them that I have a high degree of confidence in, even though a couple of them have really gotten beaten up recently, but the vast majority of those 17,000, um, you know, players outside of, you know, your bitcoins and your Ethereums and, and a couple of other, uh, you know, altcoins, the vast majority of those are actually going to be scams. And uh, the vast majority of the ones that aren't scams are really going to be crass and unimaginative money grabbing schemes. Folks, look through and read the white papers associated with all of these cryptocurrencies. If you strip out the name of the cryptocurrency or the, you know, the project, the, uh, the blockchain project in there, you cannot tell the difference between these. There's nothing that distinguishes them, especially all of the so-called uh, Ethereum killers. I think the first five or six of them that came out or uh, some, some of the ones that are that have the, the largest developer communities right now have a chance of sticking around. But the vast majority of these are going to fail and they're going to fail like really, really hard. It's not even going to be, uh, it, it's it basically not even going to be a, uh, a question. So a spokesman for Robinhood Markets said that the company told the SEC when they, when they sort of, when they disclosed uh, you know, cryptocurrency that they believe that crypto's custodians on its platform is a customer's property and shouldn't become Robin Hood's property in bankruptcy. But this view has not been tested in court. So there's always the risk uh, that it could be viewed as uh, the platform property. And trust me, that is going to be tested in court at some time unless some regulations are passed. So when it comes to owning cryptocurrency, having an offline wallet is definitely the safer way to go. Like if you hold your assets at Coinbase, there really isn't even a guarantee that they belong. They really belong to you. Right. Um, and it's not like owning stocks in the brokerage account where across all all across the Western world, Singapore and Japan, we have definitive rules that 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 
you know, that those, uh, those uh, securities belong to you and not to the platform. Those rules are not put together in the in the case of cryptocurrency. So that's one of the things you guys want to look at here. So, uh, by the way, we're looking at Barons. Um, this is one of the things that that uh, you know the folks in my Patreon group pay for is my access to premium news services here. So we are behind the paywall. I guess if Barons knew about this, I, I could get in trouble. So um, let me see here. But my channel is so small that people aren't really paying attention. So Shoeless Joe says, uh, "Don't understand why crypto exchanges can't offer." independently insured accounts. So uh, it's largely because the government regulation hasn't put in place yet. Um, you, you, They can't just arbitrarily say that these funds belong to the client and they're not subject to our creditors. So, um, yeah. Let me see here. Do you, and Demo says, do you think that QT starting in June 1st is already priced into the market? I do. Uh, but here's what I think is priced into the market is a roll off of assets from the Fed's balance sheet. I, I don't believe that anyone expects the Fed to rapidly sell things that are on um, on their balance sheet. Uh, they they basically don't want to uh, flood the market. Well, I mean, they they do want to raise interest rates some more, and that would be actually a really good way to cause some market pressure on interest rates, cause those to rise without the Fed stepping in and having to raise interest rates by another half a point. What if, and that's the thing, the Fed doesn't control interest rates completely. It's always this balance between where the Fed sets rates and where the market sets the rates as well. Now, the adage goes, of course, don't fight the Fed, uh, you know, the, but the thing is, the Fed could be using those asset sales as kind of a publicity move. Rather, they're going to cause the market for it you know, to push interest rates up a little bit higher. But they're not going to go out and raise interest rates by a half point next time. Half a point interest raise this time around was really a signal to the market that we are serious about ending inflation. Um, it, it that was just a signal, right? It's really just playing politics, just doing things for the public. Uh, when QT, they're going to start unwinding it, meaning quanti you know quantitative tightening here of the balance sheet, meaning they're going to take the nine trillion dollars that they have in debt that the the Federal Reserve owns. And they're going to start getting some of that off of their, their balance sheet. A lot of that involves uh, just letting assets run off the balance sheet, meaning you got a 30 year bond, it's going to mature in the next uh, six months, and you're just not going to buy a new bond with that money. That's, that's one of the things that's going to happen. So you're going to receive back that principal payment from the bond because at the end of the, of the maturity period, all that principal gets paid back to the Federal Reserve. They're not going to release that uh, back into the market. And I think that is what is already priced into. Uh, the market. I, I don't think an aggressive sale of securities is priced into the market at this time. So there's definitely potential for more volatility in the market. And I wanted to talk to you guys about that in particular today. We aren't done. And, and I was kind of expecting today for the market to be up again. I thought we'd have a little bit of momentum coming out of Friday where the, everything looked great, where you had that sort of that, that bull, mar bull market possible trap rally. And, and just make the point that, that that we are in for a longer haul than you might think, that volatility is not over at this point, that uh, caution is um, caution if you're stretched is certainly advised. If you're not stretched, meaning you don't have anything on margin, you got plenty of cash sitting around, I wouldn't rush to make all of your investments at once. I would pick and choose and I would be wise about who's going to not just survive but thrive in the next decade and think that, the, that whatever comes over the next decade is not going to be what it was like in the last decade. I, uh, I, I remember when I first got back, in, back into the, uh, or got into the industry years and years and years ago, I read this article, it was like year 2000 or, 2000 or something, where the dot-coms had crashed. And there was this whole new group of technology leaders that, uh, that Barron's actually thought was going to be the top 10 stocks in, in the next 10 years. And, and basically none of them were. And I, I remember like Juniper Networks was one of those, uh, in a, some, a company that went out of business was one of those, but in, in almost every case, none of those were the top 10 because they were still basing what they thought the next 10 years was going to look like based on what the last 10 years was going to look like. Just like how, we, how, you know, military analysts say that generals are always preparing to fight the last war. Uh, in a lot of case, uh, people who look at the stock market or, or looking are, Amateurs who look at the stock market and look at the way they invest, they look at the way things went 10 years ago or for the last 10 years and think they're going to do, you know, go the same way. 
that's not going to happen. That's the one thing I can guarantee that happened that, that I can guarantee. I, I can't make a lot of predictions without eventually looking like a jerk because, you know, the universe basically exists to make anyone who makes predictions look like a jerk. But this is the one prediction that I can make is that uh, it, it's going to be radically different than in the last 10 years. So think, uh, have a more forward vision about where you think the market is going to go when it comes to your investments over the next couple of months. I think that even more than I, the pandemic to me represented a massive short-term opportunity to turn around 40, 50, 60% gain in, in a single year. And for a lot of folks that actually turned out to be a lot better because of various anomalies, right? But there was always a good short-term opportunity there in this case, we're looking at right now a very excellent, if you have the money sitting on the sidelines, we're looking at an excellent long-term opportunity to get ahead of the curve in terms of investments, get ahead of um, you know some trends that are happening right now, some technological changes, and you're going to be able to do it for very, very cheap. FinTech in particular is absolutely on sale. There are some great companies with improving financials, growing sales, uh, you know, margins that are getting better. And they are priced at two, three, five, six dollars a share. Uh, you know, SoFi is one of those. Moneyline is one of those. Moneyline, I'm, I'm kind of on the fence on, but to be honest with you, their numbers keep looking better and better and better. You know, so uh, let me see here. Let me let me move on to some questions here. Um, every time the market goes up, people think it's a. Uh, every time it goes up, people think it's a bull run. It doesn't work that way. That's true. Um, that's true. And a lot of people don't realize is that also when really bad days in the market happen, I mean, the, the worst days in the market happen, um, the turnaround usually happens pretty quickly after those worst days in the market. So they're out of the market in that case. They think they're timing the market. What they're really doing is they're they're missing out on the gains. The market very seldomly holds on to any single day's gain. And it's literally something like, one day for every two years. And I know that sounds crazy coming out of my mouth right now, but look up best 10 or best 10 days of the market, right? It's a, it's some research you can look up on Google best 10 days of the market. That research has been going on at least since 2005. And in every rolling 20 year period since 2005, if you miss the best 10 days of the market in a 20 year period, it essentially eliminated 70% of your return. Now those numbers are very rough. It, it, fluctuates a little bit, but in general, the best 10, the best 10 days in the market happened within 10 days of the worst 10 days in the market in that same time period. And if you miss the best 10 days in the market in a 20 year period, your returns were going to be reduced by about 70%. Don't believe me. Go look this up on yourself, yourselves. A bunch of different research companies have done, uh, have done this and they've determined this to be true. So uh, let's go back to crypto for a minute. Eric M says we are in a crypto winter right now. And uh, he thinks that it's similar to the tech bubble. This seems like it'd take another year to unravel. Uh, I, I don't disagree with that. I, I really don't. The last crypto winter that we went through, I, I missed out on the, uh, the original run up to like $18,000 or something like that for Bitcoin. And then when it dropped back down to the four or $5,000 range, I started doing like $50 a month in, um, you know, just a, just a, a, a regular purchase. And that worked out fairly well for me. And I took some of the money off the table last year. Uh, I just got a little bit lucky, but I got crushed in one of the picks that I made last year, which was Algorand. And, uh, my, my opinion in general about, um, about about Algorand, but not just Algorand, but about altcoins in general has changed pretty radically over the last couple of months. It, it doesn't matter how great I think a uh, project is. It doesn't matter how many people are, um, how, are developing for that project. It doesn't matter how widespread the use is. None of that says anything about, about how, you know, which direction a token is actually going to go into. So I think that the only cure for you know, not understanding tokenomics is going to be time because it's not acting like an actual asset class right now. It has zero correlation to anything. It kind of does whatever the hell it wants to do. And I think that that period is going to last for quite some time. And it's uh, it's going to take a while to iron that out. So, uh, Eric, you asked the question that I definitely wanted to uh, address today. Is Twitter merger arbitrage worth it? Probably not. And uh, a couple of things today. Actually, let's, let's talk about this right now. Um, and I don't know how familiar you guys are with the SEC with um, 
all the rules you know surrounding what a CEO can and cannot say uh, when he is the uh, you know, CEO of a publicly traded company or he's looking to purchase something like that. There are a lot of rules surrounding what you can and cannot say. Elon Musk uh, thinks that the rules don't apply to him. Uh, he thinks that legal disclosures uh, don't apply to him. There are many things that he has said uh, over the last couple of days that have actually, and you can look forward to a lawsuit from Tesla holders uh, against Elon Musk relatively soon. And uh, and I'll tell you, these are probably going to be institutional holders. The value of the stock uh, that a Tesla holder has had has gone up by 20 or 30%, go down by 20, 30% just on the things that he says. And every time he says something like that, he's going to end up getting sued. Just like the very famous funding secured tweet that he made back in 2018, where the SEC slapped a gag order on him. More of those are probably coming at this point. So I do not believe that the Twitter deal is going to happen right now. I think there's a very narrow pathway for that Twitter deal to happen. I also think that Elon Musk doesn't want it to happen anymore, that he's getting cold feet, and then he wants an excuse to pay that billion dollars and move on, right? He wants, uh, you know, he says the, the sample size that he had was 100 accounts, and uh, he's saying that the Twitter's legal team that he broke told him that he broke the NDA by revealing its sample size for fake accounts. Elon Musk telling us that Twitter's legal team told him that they broke the NDA by revealing its sample size for fake accounts, that is probably also breaking the NDA, okay? Now, I don't know exactly what their NDA is like, but it usually uh, it usually covers almost everything that's in there. So, uh, yeah, and he says all kinds of other things in this that the $44 billion takeover is temporarily on hold. Merely announcing that before you made certain filings is also probably going to catch the attention of the SEC. Uh, so no, so I, I, and there's a, a number of different reasons. He's been shopping around uh, for uh, other investors to help him fund this consortium in order to leverage this buyout. He said it a couple of times that this is not some way to make money. Well, folks, the purpose of a business is to do business and that's its only business or should be its only business. If you're telling us that you want to go out and borrow $44 billion to buy a company and not expect to make money on it, then I, I mean, you, there's a lot of folks that are not going to loan you that money. So, and I think that he really has figured out at this point that he doesn't want to put up, uh, you know, his Tesla shares in order to finance that deal because there's a risk of a margin call. If they decline by uh, a certain percentage that there's a risk of a margin call. So um, we see here and what do you think of a potential SoFi reverse split? So I think it's only responsible that they, because they're approaching, they were approaching the sort of like a $5 a share uh, limit there. And so if you're below $1 a share on the NASDAQ and you stay there for more than 30 days, you have to do something, right? You have to either uh, leave the exchange, you have to do a, uh, uh, you know, a reverse merger or something like that. Uh, that's a legal disclosure that they probably had to make as well. It's also a smart one to put it in there well ahead of time in case that does happen. It's a terrible idea. In this case, it would be uh, enormously destructive to the enterprise value or the market cap of the company. And it would be really, really bad. Uh, but I think the market is figuring out that they've uh, vastly over discounted the growth potential of, of, uh, of, of SoFi. I think that we may have hit bottom last week on SoFi. And unless things really, really go bad in the economy, I don't think that it's going to get uh, that much. Uh, I, I don't think that it's going to get that much worse because I, I think you're, you're looking at this company still bringing in a billion and a half dollars in revenue this year, about $1.4 billion in revenue. Uh, and, and there are other fintechs that are in the same boat, like Upstart. You saw that they had now. I managed to grab, and I wish I had more money, but I managed to grab like 20 shares of Upstart when it was down in the $26, $27 range. I wish I had more money to buy more because it's already up to like the $37 uh, range at this point. Upstart's another company where I'm a little bit worried about the health of their portfolio if we go into a period of high unemployment. Um, but I am less worried about their actual uh, business going forward. They are making money now. They are growing their business. They kind of hit it out of the ballpark in terms of their earnings, and the stock still absolutely crashed because they reduced their forward guidance a little bit. Uh, you know, SoFi did the same thing, but I think that folks are not properly calculating what that actually means. So uh, let's see. Patrick Mulligan says, Elon is not helping the S&P at the moment. No, he's not. 
and that's the thing is that his company makes up such a large uh, component of the SEC that his comments actually mean a lot in terms of the wealth for millions upon upon millions of people in the United States. And that's what I think that he never considers. He never considers how an offhand, rather careless remark can cause somebody out there to panic. And I don't think he actually cares. I don't think there is any way to make him care about that. Uh, it's uh yeah, but, and, and that's honestly, that's not what I pay him for. And when I say I pay him for, I mean, I've, I've owned Tesla stock for a long time and, uh, but I'm starting to get more and more impatient with his, uh, what I like to call extracurricular interests. So I think he should be worried about SpaceX, Tesla, and not much else. Um, yeah. So you see, I, I hate RS been burned twice. Okay. Um, wait, what, what are you talking about when you mean RS? You'd have to uh, clarify that. Um, M. Sieber says upstart is way oversold. I definitely agree with that assessment. Like I said, if I could have afforded at that time, I just didn't have the free cash um, the, to buy a full hundred shares at that moment. I, I would have done it. Um, my habit is to sell way out of the money um, covered calls on on really volatile stocks like that. Anyway, uh, just to sort of like soften the blow if it declines anymore. But way out of the money cover calls, so I can I can generate something on the way up as well. Uh, generally, with a um, you know a, of a delta like 0.2 or or below, because I don't actually want to sell the stock most of the time. I just want to generate a little bit of income to do that. And, and I've built a couple of different positions just by selling, um, yeah, you know, just by selling cover calls. And then uh, yeah, so Patrick Mulligan says. Uh, reverse split lost a lot on NSPR and it never recovered. It, it, that's actually the case with a lot of, uh, a lot of stocks. Actually, one of the big things uh, that I think should be investigated, but it probably never will be is that nano dimension actually had a reverse split. And I think it was like a 50 to one reverse split. I may be wrong on that. It was either a 30 to one or a 50 to one reverse split about nine to 12 months before they had their giant run in uh in 2020 and 2021 right and uh it, it, it actually is in 2020 late 2020 early 2021 where it was completely based on speculation and uh yeah so that was one of the things that really kind of blew me away this is a company that that had been has been around for a long time has been losing money for years yeah they have an interesting product yes they had a patent it, it's it's very difficult to understand which patents can be circumvented and which ones can't unless you are a, uh, a you know an actual engineer and uh, Eric M, thank you so much. Canadian six dollars and ninety nine cents super stickers. Oh, I guess I forgot to tell you guys that um, the uh, the super fat chat features are on. If you feel so inclined, please uh, feel free to ask any question about finance or any stock. If I don't know the answer, then I will tell you. Okay, so let me see here. Today was earnings for a company called OEG, and I hope uh, you can take a look into Quick. It's a market cap of eighty million. The Q1 was seventy million. Earnings have I don't know what I'm missing here. Uh, so let me see here. So I don't know that Coifin is going to pull up the, the the latest numbers here. And uh, we're looking at Orbital Energy Group. Is what we're looking at here. And then let me see here. Price and volume first. Open Energy Group has been declining since June 2021. Uh, and let's see what they do. I'm not actually familiar with what they do. So, All right. So let's take a look at that. And then I don't know why my internet connection gets so slow whenever I do a... Um, a, a live stream because I just upgraded my upload speed. So I thought it would be a little bit faster, but Hey, I, I uh, am in one of those places where we have a monopoly on our connection. Like I literally cannot get anything but Cox cable out here. And uh, actually I don't know why sundial grower sh showed up. Gee. Huh? Orbital energy group. Let's see. So um, how much do I like you? iPath, Solar Telegram. How much are you good? Okay. Let me see here. Orbital Energy Group. Which makes sense. Oh, man. My internet connection is super slow today. Um, all right. So I'm going to be looking at financial analysis here. 
Let's look at income statement, Orbital Energy Group. And this is absolutely excruciating. Uh, I'm sorry for my slow chances. So, uh, oh, this is actually a really good question. Really good question. Um, and I'm going to get back to yours, M. Sever, in just a minute. Any chance that USA natural gas pricing catches up to European or international pricing? I would actually say that there's a good chance of that happening just because we're going to start exporting more and more of our natural gas. The only reason we're not matching international rates right now, well, there's two reasons. No, number one is, Unlike the and most folks who um, who are looking at the news right now don't understand this, oil is a global market. Everything is priced on on uh, you know uh, based on a couple of different global markets, and uh, there's no one has any real control over what's going on. It's really just a, a function of supply and demand and who decides to limit supply, right? Uh, because demand is not really all that all that fluid. Uh, the natural gas market is not internationalized. It is very local. And that's because up until recently, there hasn't been this great demand to ship liquid natural gas. You've always wanted to do it via pipelines. And pipelines are, of course, limited by, you know, we, we, we're not crossing giant bodies of water, you know, from the United States to build a pipeline in New Europe, or at least we're not doing that yet. We barely even laid cables underwater to do that. So, the uh, natural gas world has been relatively localized, right? You'll have groups of countries that function as one market, but you don't generally, but we don't really have an international market. So there have been vast price differences between uh, natural gas in the United States, natural gas in Europe for, for quite some time now. And uh, natural gas prices in the United States were artificially depressed back about 2003, 2004 timeframe. And they never really recovered to uh, like previous amounts. And it, because there was uh, less demand here, that actually caused less investment in exportation of this fuel as well. Like there was a big push, I want to say back in 2000, 2007, 2008, right before everything fell apart, uh, dry bulk shipper, shippers were actually investing a lot into liquid natural gas ships as well to, to transport uh, liquid natural gas. Well, that all fell apart because of the... Uh, because of the recession in 2008, 2009. Uh, and that's starting to change now. So we are going to be, the United States is probably going to be a huge beneficiary of what's going on right now with Europe moving off of, uh, of Russian oil and particularly moving off of Russian natural gas. And if, uh, if, if Kiev can, or if the Ukrainians can manage to hold on to Luhansk, uh, they are going to be one of the big beneficiaries as well as there are, giant natural gas fields in Luhansk that have not been um, not been exploited at this time. And I, I suspect that they're probably, if everything shakes out and they end up defeating Russia, they're going to nationalize that pipeline, take it over and use it for themselves and uh, start exporting that to Europe. But anyway, we're, we're probably going to be one of the big beneficiaries. Um, Ukraine cannot provide all of uh, Europe's natural gas needs on its own. So United Arab Emirates, the United States, and to a degree Canada are all probably going to benefit from this. So um, all right, so back to uh, this orbital group here. Hold on a second. Back to OEG here. And uh, so I don't know much about this stock. All right, so Orbital Energy Group provides electric power to telecommunications and renewable solution services in the United States and India. It designs, upstalls, and grades repair, uh, upgrades and repairs, uh, electrical power transmission, distribution, infrastructure, substation facilities. Uh, okay. Got the idea here. So what do their financials look like? This is a tiny company to begin with. Um, they do have good growth here. Let me take a look at their income statement as well. Um, and what price range were you looking at here? Like what kind of price act action were you expecting here is the question I want to ask. So because um, total revenues here for four year, full year 2021, we're looking at 82 million which is a, a, a really big increase over full year of 2021. Um, we're looking at cost of revenues. Okay, gross profit of 4.3 million. Oh, well, it, it's barely profitable. That's good. Um, and that's full year. Okay. All right. So, uh, yeah, not terrible. I, I, guess I, I guess I should ask, um, what are you expecting? And Saber says, you're from Holland where you have lots of gas, but the government doesn't want to harvest it all because of small earthquakes. Uh, I guess in that case, they're probably using some method of fracking to uh, to extract the gas from underground. So, uh, and 
and I, I and so Holland, because so many, so much of your country is reclaimed soil from the ocean, you know, using all of those dikes and all that. I guess seismic instability would be one of the things that you worry about more than most countries do. Uh, so I'm taking a look at this right here, Orbital Energy Group, and I'll be honest with you, I'm looking at the fact that they missed earnings now for four quarters in a row. Um, earnings came out today, but I don't have that. Uh, estimated right now. So I need to take a look at this. They miss or earnings for four quarters in a row there. You have volume on this stock being relatively high at 2 million shares exchanging hands every day, roughly 2 million shares, 1.7 million shares. Uh, earnings at negative, uh, uh, you know, $1 and five cents per share, but you just don't have a lot of, uh, a lot of news on this company. You just don't have, uh, yeah, there's not a lose that a lot of, not a lot, a lot of news that isn't really, Reduce or released by Orbital Energy Group themselves, meaning that there aren't a ton of uh, companies that are releasing information, like media companies releasing on uh, information on this company. It's all them that are doing it. So I, I got I got to think that there's probably a couple of big traders that are responsible for most of this volume, and um, and that's it. There are a couple of big traders responsible for the most responsible for most of this volume, and there just aren't a ton of people interested in it outside of them. Let me see here. I need to dig in more of this, but I'm just not getting a lot uh, out of what I can see from here. And I'm not getting a ton out of their uh, their income statement, right? Let me just get here. Look at cash flow real fast. And I'm going to look at fourth quarter 2021. Net income is loss of 61.3 million as fourth quarter. So increasing losses, net income. Okay. A sale. Um, yeah, honestly, man, there's just not a lot to go on when it comes to this, uh, to this stock. So, um, so you're looking for, it was, uh, looking for a big move since it was the first time being profitable. Yeah. I can't see the actual current. So this is not a stock that I follow. So I can't see the actual, uh, you know, the actual numbers here. So I, I need to dig into what profitability actually means for them. There's a lot of ways to be profitable without making any money. Uh, so let's talk about that. So um, with natural gas prices, uh, stocks pricing at $4 pricing, I imagine that natural gas stocks would all be in for an amazing decade. I want to say yes, but Eric, to be honest with you, I've been expecting a natural gas renaissance for a very long time. I thought it was going to happen in a couple of different ways. No, number one, I thought that a lot of, cars a lot of not cars but a lot of trucks like the class a trucks we're probably going to switch to a battery electric renewable natural gas or natural gas uh engine at some point um and i don't know if you guys ever remember a company called westport energy but they did actually like natural gas conversions on trucks uh to go from diesel to natural gas and it was actually a conversion kit that worked amazingly well uh but they never got off the ground i think they ended up being bought by Cummins and the uh, the technology has basically just languished and, and not really been used. And that's kind of where I expected that to go because the United States is the Saudi Arabia of natural gas. This seemed like to be the fuel of no choice for large shipping operations. And it simply didn't happen for a million different reasons. It didn't happen. So I've been waiting for this to happen for years. I hope it does happen because this could be a much larger portion of our economy there's also a lot of companies out there like Master Limited or uh, Master uh, Limited Partnerships that are uh, essentially gas pipeline par uh, partnerships that produce amazing dividends, you know, in the five six percent range when things are really cracking, uh, and and they have amazing tax properties as well, and it makes some financial planning stuff that I do really fun, and it provides a, a lot of good income. So I've been waiting for this to happen for a while, and and hopefully it does. So. Um, Interested to hear where you think the Russian economy is going to be in five years' time. Am I right in thinking that China might seek to buy out and exploit cheap right, uh, Russian assets? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. They will absolutely. Not, not just them. India is already exploiting sanctions to get a really killer deal on Russian oil. And uh, yeah, so a couple of things are happening right now. Mostly Russia cannot insure any of its shipments for anything right now. Um so, and that's one of the things you may not realize when anything leaves on a ship going from one destination to another, for one reason or another, it's going to be insured, not just by the person making the shipment, but the actual shipping company as well. Companies right now, shipping companies right now don't want to pick up anything uh, from Russia because they don't know 
that you know, between the time they leave their destination and they arrive somewhere else, that sanctions aren't going to be slapped on whatever they're carrying. So they can't get insurance. I'm sure that certain companies are willing to take that cargo without insurance. They're just going to charge you a lot more to do it. And they're going to dump it if they can't, uh, if they can't get rid of it at the port, because they're not going to allow that ship to sit there idle for months at a time until sanctions get ironed out. So where the Russian economy is in five years time, Depends on the approach that um, the United States, uh, Europe, and its allies take with Russia after this war is finished. Now, I don't think that it's a foregone conclusion that Russia loses the war like everyone else does. Uh, it, it, it's it, If you look at how the Russians won World War II, and I know there are a lot of Americans listening to this who don't realize that, that the United States did not win World War II, that Russia did the bulk of the dying and fighting in World War II. And uh, they are the ones that ended up grinding the, uh, you know, the German army into the dust. Now, you can't fight like World War II in the 21st century. That is definitely being demonstrated right now. But the resolve that they can manufacture, the industrial capacity that they have, the ability to produce war material uh, might actually, uh, you know, they might have greater resolve than the West does when it comes to spending money and supplying Ukraine. And I don't know that that's not the case. It's not certainly what I want to happen. But here's the real issue here. Five years from now, where the economy is depends on how we handle the peace. And uh, I, what I don't want to see is like another World War I situation where the West and its allies, not the United States, the United States was not punitive against Germany, but the, the rest of Western Europe was very punitive against Germany, which essentially gave rise to, uh, you know, to, to Nazi Germany after that. In this case, I would like to see us be a lot more accommodating, a lot more helpful, and not gloat about victory not to be punitive, but I want to see Russia have real economic development. I want to see them have an open society with democratic elections, a government that actually works for them. Um, I'd love to see all of their oligarchs go bye-bye, um, you know, go to prison. I don't know that that's going to happen. And certainly all of our American oligarchs aren't going to prison. Uh, but I, I think that we should be accommodating when all this is over, particularly if they are defeated. Let, let's not wallow. Let's not make them wallow in their humiliation. Let's put together something like a Marshall Plan. Being a trading partner with the United States is the best insurance against conflict, right? This is why we haven't gone to conflict with Japan since World War II. It's why we haven't gone to conflict with uh, with Germany since World War II or any of those uh, folks. It's because we have really strong trade relationships with them right now, and it doesn't make any sense. To, it's really the reason why we haven't gone to war with China either is we have really strong uh, trade relationships with us. So, um does Russia still default? What are the implications? So they, technically, they've already defaulted. All right, and they missed some dollar payments, or first they tried to uh, pay them with rubles, and then as the thirty-day mark came along, they ended up finding the dollars to do that. Uh, Russia, at this point, I am still pricing in every estimate that I have that they are going to default. Their economy is going to essentially collapse. It basically has collapsed at this point. Uh, they do have a bit of staying power, but this vaunted. You know, uh, six hundred billion dollars in uh, in assets that they have that they can draw on to pay for stuff. War is extremely expensive, and uh, they're spending far more than uh, you know a billion dollars a day uh, at war right now. They've had two thirds of their assets frozen overseas, uh, and let's say this war has already called cost them a hundred billion dollars just in operational costs. Not e not to mention the cost of replacing all of the equipment that they've lost, which. I don't know if the numbers we're seeing about what they've lost or propaganda or if they're real, but I know that just on operational costs alone and what we see in assets overseas, they are running out of money. Their government is running out of money. How are they going to pay for, for all of these operations? So, and uh, yeah, so really the, the question about where they're going to be five years from now depends on how we handle the peace. And I'm of the opinion that we should be a lot more accommodating. I don't want to create an enemy that's just going to be, much more pissed off 20 years down the road. And, uh, and I don't, and I think it would be beneficial for all of us if we all had great trade relations and we didn't have a reason to go into conflict with each other. So yeah, the, um, here we go. The USA lend lease apparently sent 200 billion to Russia in world war two, including military and food provisions. Um, yeah. So I actually, that's a really interesting story. Um, so the ice in St Stalingrad, St. Petersburg, so the United States is actually delivering like tanks, vehicles, fuel, food, everything. We're delivering it by ship 
it was actually run across frozen ice into Stalingrad uh, to, uh, you know, to supply them. So this is an interesting story. If you haven't considered Stalingrad and its importance to, you know, World War II and taking a look at Azovstal and its importance to the war here in Ukraine, I can tell you something that lesson is not lost on Russia. There's a reason why they're trying so hard to take Azovstal right now. Um, in World War II, Stalingrad was basically overrun in a couple of months and everyone was pushed back into this industrial center in the city. Does this sound familiar? And this industrial center occupied about 25% of the city. And it was a maze, right? And it was it was really hard to take and nobody was trained for urban combat at that time. When Azovstal was created, it was created with this network of underground bunkers essentially to create a Stalingrad for anyone who wanted to invade this area. And last year or the year before that, something like that, Ukrainian government uh, stocked it with food, weapons, ammunition, that sort of thing. Uh, and and they really didn't do that with the immediate anticipation of a Russian invasion. They're just kind of like planning out in the future. So, and, and if you know the story of Stalingrad, basically the Germans announced that they had conquered Stalingrad at least, you know, a hundred times. And none of it was actually true. About a quarter of the city was still held by uh, by the Red Army. And eventually, with American supplies, they were able to stage a breakout, an eventual encirclement of certain uh, German units, and, and to destroy them and to end up rolling them all the way back into, into Germany. Uh, and this lesson was not lost on the Soviets. The Soviets essentially created Azovstal with this whole thing in mind. So uh, this is one of the things that I find absolutely uh, amazing that that in a couple of different ways, uh, this conflict is being played out a lot like World War II. So, uh, yeah, but the $200 billion that we sent them in uh, military and food provisions, of course, that was never paid back. Afterwards, after World War II, of course, the United States had the Marshall uh, Program, right, where we basically paid to rebuild all of Western Europe, right? We, we gave everyone these loans. Uh, when I say loans, I'm saying that with Sticky marks are, you know, with a quotation marks around there, because there was only one country that actually paid us back for those loans. And uh, if you know who that is, uh, I'm going to spoil it for you because I can't wait. Uh, that was actually Finland. They were the only country that actually paid us back for uh, the Marshall Plan advances or loans that we gave people. So I think that was uh, really super interesting that it, that Finland is now the country here that's in question. The uh, the objection that Turkey has to admitting Sweden and Finland into NATO is BS. It is absolutely BS. But I understand Turkey's position in this case. They control the Bosphorus Straits. A lot of trade from uh, not just from Russia, but from all over the Caucasus Mountains, Ukraine, Russia, and parts of Asia goes through the Black Sea. They have to have good relationships with Russia. They have to have good relationships with Ukraine and everyone else. I understand why they can't just automatically blank and approve uh, everyone entering NATO. Like I do understand that. I think their reasoning is bullshit BS. Uh, but yeah. Anyway, so a lot of things going on there in terms of um, economics. One of the more important things that's happening is the theft of something like 100 million tons of grain has been stolen from Ukraine at this point and shipped over to Russia. I think that uh, Russian grain production may have been disrupted as well. And there are a couple of different reasons to believe that. And uh, I can definitely go you know, into those in another uh, podcast. So uh, happy to talk to you guys about anything about stocks that way off into politics today. Uh, not something I necessarily wanted to go. So I uh, go into Shoeless Joe says, Hi, how much do you like UiPath? I have not looked into UiPath. I know that you mentioned this stock before, Shoeless Joe, but this is something that I haven't uh, I haven't taken a look at. Uh, yeah, but I, I'd be glad to do that again. I just need to um, need to be reminded at some point where where that or, or it is. So back to news here when it comes to Barron's Financial. Here, uh, the headline here is Fed hawkishness may be near its peak, even if inflation isn't. Let's take a look at this headline right here. And this is going to be what dominates uh, market reaction here in the future. It's not necessarily the war in Ukraine. It's going to be uh, the Fed and what the Fed is doing and how they're saying it. Uh, I heard an NPR interview with Jerome Powell, and I think it was Kai Rizdal was the guy interviewing him. And he got tripped up a couple of times in that interview. I mean, he generally plans out everything he's going to say in 
uh, minute detail. So the April consumer price index and ongoing stock market turmoil captured much of investors' intentions, uh, attention over the past week. I, of course, think it's going to capture attention for the next couple of months. And according to this article, they may be looking in the wrong places, at least when it comes to predicting the path of Federal Reserve policy. One of the big questions investors have had lately is whether or not the so-called Fed put or the idea that the central bank will backstop financial markets and rescue investors from serious downturns is still alive. Many prognosticator, prognosticators say that it is dead because the Fed is so far behind the inflation curve that it has no choice but to tighten even if stocks crumble. Actually, um, I would go even further than that. I don't think Jerome Powell really cares that much about stock market. Uh, stock market, his only concerns are price stability, controlling inflation, and full employment. Uh, maintaining the, you know, our backstopping financial markets and rescuing investors from downturns isn't actually a part of his uh, his mandate. That's not what he's supposed to do uh, uh, as the president of the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve controls interest rates and to some degree banking policy and monetary policy. It doesn't control the stock market. It's not supposed to control the stock market. So, so the S&P 500 is down 14% from its January 2022 all-time highs. Losses approaching the roughly 20% decline that prompted the Fed in January of 2019 to stop shrinking its balance sheet. This time, quantitative tightening, or QT, hasn't even started, and central bankers sound increasingly hawkish despite the carnage. Like I said earlier in uh, this live stream, I don't believe uh, that, that QT is going to happen or quantitative tightening or you know shrinking the balance sheet is going to happen by them actively selling things right now. I think they're going to allow, there's like a couple billion dollars a month that's going to roll off of their balance sheet, even if they do nothing, just because those assets are, those bonds are going to maturing. So are going to be maturing. So this time quantitative tightening or QT, has, like I said, hasn't started. The Fed put probably still exists if at much lower strike price than the investors have come to expect, meaning that uh, this is article is saying that it's not going to be a 20% loss when the Fed steps in. It's going to be a much greater uh, loss when the Fed steps in, say 30% or more. The article doesn't say that. That's what I'm saying. So uh, there are some big issues right now that we should take a look at, though. Uh, investors are probably looking at the wrong market. It's pain in the credit markets. That's ultimately going to make the Fed relent, says Joe Lavornia, chief economist for America's at Netaxis. Actually, that's entirely correct. Uh, let me see here. I did want to say thank you, Shoeless Joe, uh, five uh, British pounds there. Thank you so much. Um, is the Activision merger worth it? Yes, because that's a lot more likely to happen. Uh, Microsoft has the cash to make that deal happen. And uh, the only thing that might stop that deal from happening is objection from um, from the uh, the uh, was it the the FTC or the SEC. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't know that that's going to happen. So. Um, yeah, so right now the yield on, um, hold a second here, one question. So last last time I asked you about Joby Aviation, you said you thought his drone delivery uh, mentioned that you were not like you need vertical lift off because of the noise. Uh, but Joby has solved that issue. If you don't mind, can you have a look at the company and stocks and share your thoughts on the future industry? Uh, yes, I will definitely do that. I, I'm not sure if I'm going to get that to that today, but I will definitely do that. This is something that folks have brought up uh, numerous times. So uh, just wanted to talk a little bit more about what's going on here. Um, if you guys aren't familiar with uh, fixed income, meaning like bonds and debt, you should be. And I know that this has not been a popular subject over the last, I don't know, 20 years or so because of what interest rates have done, but it's actually more important to what the Fed is going to, the decisions that the Fed is going to make than the stock market will ever be. So the yield on CCC rated debt relative to treasuries has been widening quickly as investors expect the weakest companies to come under pressure as the economy slows. This could be a useful gauge for predicting Fed policy, meaning that um, there is a difference in the credit quality of companies that you're looking at. If I want to borrow money from, uh, say, ADP, which is one of the uh, best capitalized companies on the planet, one of the safest companies on the planet, highest cash reserve, uh, low expenses, they can live off the cash reserve for like years. Or if I wanted to take a look at you know something that's rated CCC or below, uh, think right now, uh, was it uh, MicroStrategy? I wouldn't loan money to MicroStrategy at this point um, because of the, the the risk that they have. I mean, they're I don't know that they are rated, but they would definitely be related uh, rated at this point as below investment grade 
because of all of the risks they have on their balance sheet. In times like we've had in, a lot, in the past 10 years where interest rates have been so low, there isn't that much difference between buying AAA rated debt and you know debt that's rated junk, meaning um, you know that third or fourth category down is 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 rated as junk, because the chances of one of those companies actually defaulting on their loans or going on, going out of business is actually fairly low because the economy has been growing. Right, that is no longer the case. Investors are starting to price in the difference in credit quality at this point, and it and it. it gets a little bit more jarring once you move further out onto uh, the maturity curve there. So this is another sign that's uh, that investors are anticipating that weaker companies are going to come under pressure as the economy slows. And at this point, the economy is expected to slow, right? We, we, aren't, we aren't expecting, uh, you know, a huge growth, but the spread grew to about 10% in the past week, the highest level since late 2020 uh, and around levels where the Fed has previously eased monetary policy to counter slowing economic growth. Lavornia pegs the sp- strike price of a Fed put at a yield spread of around 1,500 basis points or 15% between CCC rated debt and the five-year U.S. Treasury note, right? So, uh, that is an important distinction to make. More than I've heard a lot of people say, oh, when the 10-year treasury reaches 2%, that's when we're going to see a market crash. Or when the 10-year treasury reaches 3%, that's when we're going to see a market crash. Or that's when we're going to see the Fed step in and ease. Um, I, I think that this is probably the best indication. When you see a 15% difference between CCC rated debt and the five-year U.S. Treasury note, that's when you're seeing a deterioration in um, in uh in that, uh, you know, in, in credit quality and is seeing a deterioration in the credit markets. That's when you see quantitative tightening is probably going to stop and they might reverse course on interest rates. Might, might, because I think that the inflation here is the bigger concern. So, uh, yeah, so the CPI report in April wasn't good. And, uh, you know, with 8.3% at a pace from last year, it's actually a decline a little bit from the month before. So the rate of acceleration is declining here. Uh, but no, still not good by any means. We see here, and let's get to a question. I started out being bullish on LILM, but I'm becoming a bit more excited about Joby. Hey, uh, I'm going to look into that stock. Uh, like I said, this is not one that I was interested in before for a variety of different reasons. I just wasn't convinced the technology was going to work, but definitely willing to change my mind if I uh, if I if I see that uh, something out there. Could, basically, definitely willing to change my mind if I see something out there that that would change it. So. Um, stocks were wavering a little bit today. It looks like Bitcoin was off of its lows also. And, um, yeah, this is the great article right here. It's like how a stable coin fueled a crypto crash. Sound off in the comments below. Let me know how many of you guys got burned by Luna. So, uh, it, it's happened to a couple people in, um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, by Terra rather and, and Luna. It happened to a couple of folks in my discord chat. Now, and I've talked about this a couple of times. I don't recommend investing in every crap coin that's out there. I think that most coins are actually going to uh, collapse um, because they're not. There's nothing that distinguishes them from each other. And I think in the end, we're going to have five or six winners, and everyone else is going to uh, be irrelevant. But uh, yeah, so Terra collapses, breaks the buck. Uh, and I don't know if you guys are familiar with money markets. But money market funds are typically supposed to be, you know, one dollar per share. It's been that way forever. A couple of times in history, we've had money market funds break the buck, and it's usually been catastrophic signs for the economy. I don't. This is not a catastrophic sign for the economy. All right. So uh, a stable coin breaking the buck here it, it says more about cryptocurrency than it does about the uh, the uh, general economy. But the episode, like this article says, could shake the foundations of, crypt- uh, of crypto since. Stable coins are supposed to be the bedrock of trading and lending activities, right? They're supposed to provide that liquidity to individual traders and funds and market makers on, uh, you know, centralized exchanges and for DeFi as well. So uh, this article states that more than 90% of trading volume in crypto actually occurs in stable coins, according to coin market cap, which actually that really surprises me. So without stable coins doing the job, uh, holding their dollar pegs, which that was the big thing. A lot of these coins are not holding their dollar pegs, right? They, they aren't doing it. Um, 
which it, it's going to be harder to do in an inflationary environment as well. So, uh, you know, the, the depegging is alarming for all cryptocurrency markets. This isn't just a concern for traders and firms, uh, you know, in that $1.3 trillion uh, market. Uh, regulators worry that if stable coins take off as privately issued digital money, then they could pose a risk to broader markets and to monetary policies. And this, I think, is where we're going to see the biggest resistance from central banks to cryptocurrency is in is in stable coins. There are already conspiracy theories growing out of this that um, that you know all of these cryptocurrency crashes based on stable coins or tether or whatever that uh, that all of these are instituted in some conspiracy by you know central banks that want to have their own digital currency. I don't know that that's true or not. Um, I, I tend to doubt that. I'm, I'm actually a conspiracy theory doubter because I don't believe. One of the big problems with conspiracy theories is that people believe in the competence of people who are executing these conspiracy theories. I work for large corporations in the government for too long to realize that nobody is really all that competent. Okay. So yeah, uh, let me see here. Um, she was Joe says, yo, I got burned sort of, I had a small amount in Luna and you know, how you get burned is kind of uh relative. Like I, we know someone who got burned, with $500. Now it may seem like not a lot of money to some people, but to a lot of people who work on hourly wage or something like that, $500 represents a lot of their time that they slaved away for something that now evaporated. Um, and, and I don't blame anyone for, for this happening. And I've kind of made this point that this is like a gold rush before. Uh, and somebody else, I did the video like two years ago on, uh, on all the Chinese EV companies stating that in the United States, somewhere between, you know, in between 1900 and 1940, there were like 1600 different auto companies that went, that, that started up here in the United States. And there were only three left after World War II, basically, right? Everyone else went out of business. If you invested in any of those companies, it would have been worthless. Somebody basically stole my entire narrative from that video and, and made a TikTok out of it. And I felt very flattered by it. And they even stole some of the footage from my video too, which I feel very flattered about it, uh, but they didn't give me credit. But uh, that idea is actually true through everything here. Um, with cryptocurrency, you're going to have 17, 15, 100,000 different cryptocurrencies. Most of them are going to fail. We're going to have four or five winners out of them. De predicting who those winners are is going to be really tough. Like the only... The only predictions that I make with any degree of confidence are Bitcoin and Ethereum are, are going to be around pretty much forever uh, with everyone else being suspect. Even some of my favorite projects, I think, are, are relatively suspect. Um, but yeah, Algorand is the one where I'm down big on at this point. Uh, but I don't pay too much attention to my uh, Bitcoin holdings or my Ethereum holdings because I've had them for so long at this point. I can eat uh, volatility like, it's, uh, like it tastes great. So uh dogecoin ether seem faster than bitcoin a lot of a lot of a lot of news today when it comes to uh it comes to uh cryptocurrencies let's take a look at little technology news here when it comes to barons you get to structure your own uh your own feed here and uh let's take a look at tech stocks have fallen hard what could make them drop even more so tumbling tech stocks uh, valuations have consequences. The self is pushing management teams to think to rethink their old ways of chasing growth with profligate spending. The new round of belt tightening threatens to cascade into a bigger problem, a slowdown in enterprise technology spending. Okay, that is a big problem, uh, meaning they're not going to be spending as much on research and development. Along with a rapidly fading global economy, it could drive another leg down in the industry's earnings outlook. Since last month, well-known technology investors have been waving the caution flag, telling executives to act quickly in the tougher market environment. One of the biggest uh, capital venture firms or venture capital firms chimed in on Friday and told startup founders they should reassess their financial situation and adjust spending plans accordingly. So who's going to be hurt by spending plans accordingly when it comes to like these firms? I think it's mostly going to be employee compensation. And I think uh, that, and here's what shouldn't happen, but probably will. Uh, I think that uh, you're probably looking at stock compensation plans being changed uh, pretty pretty radically. And uh, we're probably going to look at trying to tighten the market when it comes to labor expenses, which I think is a big mistake for these companies. So um, hold on just a second. Eric M says, I'd imagine amazing games come if we see an 80 or 90% drawdown in either Ether or Bitcoin. 
uh, meaning 80 to 90 percent draw point uh, drawdown from current levels. Of course, of course. But we've gone through one. Well, actually, we've gone through two crypto winters now since uh, since Bitcoin came out. And in the last one, uh, in, like 2017, 2018, I saw a lot of lost faith in crypto and a lot of people never got back in. Uh, were it to happen again, I think that the market would be would be shrunk pretty, pretty rapidly. Uh, so I made a pretty uh, erroneous statement in my last live stream where I talked about MicroStrategy. And uh, man, honestly, here's how it happened. I've been listening to Micro, Michael Saylor talk forever about Bitcoin that I actually forgot that the company that is a CEO of is not is not a Bitcoin miner. <laughs> they are, they're like a B two B software company, right? And but he and this is one of the things. If you're the CEO of a major company, you should be talking about your own company rather than Bitcoin all the time. But I looked into some of the bets that he's made on Bitcoin, how he's used uh, free company cash flow to purchase Bitcoin, and then he's used that Bitcoin as leverage to borrow money and go out and buy other Bitcoin. And now I read an article stating that if Bitcoin drops below $21,000, he's probably going to get a margin call. Uh, I mean, and, and so I think there's a tremendous amount of danger for MicroStrategy at this point. Bitcoin is simply volatile. The idea that it can't go back over 60000 or it can't go under 20000 all of those ideas are are, um, are are equally ridiculous. Either one of them could happen. Uh, meaning, I don't, meaning, I don't think they're ridiculous at all. I think that Bitcoin could go back up to sixty thousand dollars in the next year. I think it could drop below twenty thousand dollars in the next month. Right? I don't know that either one of those scenarios is out of the question. The crazy thing is that that Michael Saylor has bet, and not just by buying Bitcoin. That wouldn't be so bad. Buying Bitcoin or the free cash flow of your company. But borrowing money against that and, and having margin debt on Bitcoin using basically 100% of the free cash flow from your company, that, that's a huge risk. I don't know it's actually 100%, but it looked like a lot of the free cash flow of the company. So uh, I misspoke quite a bit on the last live stream. They are definitely not a uh, Bitcoin miner. Michael Saylor is just one of the biggest uh, Bitcoin bulls out there, maximalists out there, really. So, uh, yeah. But very interesting how things are working uh, this way when it comes to uh, tech stocks, right? So the market that was versus the market that is, this is how we've been working with founders to adjust as the market changes at uh, at 16Z. So the framework for nav navigating down markets. I can't even read that. So I'm not going to read that to you guys. I need to get my reading glasses or whatever. So um yeah, so companies that look like they're going to do well here in the future, I would look at companies that are buying and selling commodities at this point. Uh, I think energy looks pretty good in the intermediate term. Uh, I think, uh, who was it? The the Potash. I can't remember the name of the company. That's a big Potash producer, but they look uh, very good at this point right now too. And, uh, and, and that's because they make fertilizer. That's going to be a huge market here in the next couple of months. All right. Let me see here. All right, folks. I This was an impromptu live stream today. I really didn't have a, I had a little bit of time in between appointments and things I needed to do. Just wanted to get on here and talk to you folks. And oh, what about uranium companies? So uh, M Server says, what about uranium companies? Man, so here's my issue with that is uh, I'm actually a big fan of nuclear and I don't have a problem with nuclear power. But there's a lot of anti-nuclear power hysteria in the United States for a variety of reasons. So for a couple of reasons, I think that nuclear power is in our, um, so uh, Michael will, I, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll address that, 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 uh, that comment at some point. Uh, but I need to take a, a deeper look into that, see really what the truth is. Right. So, uh, all right. So with, when it comes back to uranium companies, so there's a couple of different things that are going on right now. Like we need here in the Western United States, we need water. And one of the best ways of getting that is going to be through desalinization. Uh, but we don't have the power generation capabilities to do that either. We're going to do this massive investment into solar, which we don't necessarily have the room to do that in a lot of locations. We need this, or we can do these like micro reactors, like micro nuclear reactors, which are available. Some of these, uh, He's basically like salt cooled micro reactors that I don't know enough about the technology to talk about right now, but you, they're, they're essentially the size of, you know, a dryer, 
right? And I'm not kidding. They're literally that size and they can produce enough power to boil enough water, seawater to power, you know, to basically provide water for like a thousand homes a piece. And we could in the future have those scattered all over the United States if it weren't for all of the fear, uncertainty and doubt surrounding those, uh, those many nuclear reactors. I think at some point we have sort of an aggressive campaign to change the minds of people about nuclear power and uh, what its potential is. So I'm not completely, I'm definitely not completely against it. It's a clean energy. If we have, if we're using technology like Finland's feeder reactor system. Uh, yeah. So MicroStrategy CEO was on Yahoo Finance earlier today saying that the margin call at 21K is fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Uh, so definitely I want to see the proof of that because uh, from what I was seeing in this article, it it looks like it looks like the possibility is is definitely there. Um, but anyway, uh, like my issue with micro strategy at this point, and this is just after like two days of looking into this, so I'm definitely not uh, an expert in this company. Uh, is that he should be talking about MicroStrategy and not about Bitcoin all the time. He's a CEO of MicroStrategy. They have their own like software business. Uh, anyway, so uh, yeah, so I'm going to try and take a look at Joby for you, Elans. Thank you guys for tuning in overseas. Like I said, this was an impromptu sort of, I you know, give you guys a half an hour warning before I got on. I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to try and do live streams pretty much all this week. And then I'm coming out with some new research on a couple of other companies as well. Thank you so much. And I will see you next time. Thank you for all of the uh, the uh, super chats and stickers you guys sent me. I really appreciate that.